Father, we just thank you. Lord, we praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you it has in it the seed and the power to set people free, Father. You said in your word that if we'll continue in your word, then we'll be your disciples and that we'll know the truth and the truth will make us free. So, Father, I thank you that even as we go, go through these things this morning, that freedom will come. Holy Spirit, begin to open the eyes of our understanding to your truth and impact the hearts of people this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, I started a series called 37 Miracles of Jesus. The Gospels record 37 different miracles. And so what we're going to do is we're taking the time to go through these because from these, from these miracles, you can, you can see practical application of truth for your own lives. There's a diversity, there's differences, and, and as we go through them, you can see it from two different perspectives. You can see it from the perspective of the person that received the miracle, and that's awesome. And as we look at one today, we're going to be, we're, we're going to be able to see it from this, this woman's perspective. And then number two, we can look at it from Jesus' perspective. All right, so as I go through, as I read through the miracles, and as I read through some of the stories and the things that we find in the Gospels, what I love to do is, is put myself in their shoes, I don't, just read a, I don't just read a story to read a story and think, wow, that was a neat story and that was a cool thing that happened 2,000 years ago. No, see, Jesus came to be our model. He came to be our example. He came to show us what a living, reigning uh, person, a God-filled person can live like here on the earth. The Bible says in Romans 5, 17, my favorite scripture, you should all be able to quote it by now, those that receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, it says they will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. All right, so, so, so Jesus came not so that we could be defeated, not so that we'd have ups and downs, not so that we could just experience a little rain and a little sunshine, but he actually came to elevate our life to one of, of being able to rule and to reign and not be subject to sin and sickness and disease and darkness and evil anymore. The Bible actually says in first, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, it says that we have been given precious promises that through these promises we might be partakers or share in the divine nature. What's the divine nature? That's God's nature. His nature being our nature now. And then it says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We've escaped all of that. We are part of a different kingdom. And so what Jesus did on the earth was showed, he showed what a, a righteous, holy, uh, sanctified, sinless man as he lives on the earth, how he can reign in life. And so as I go through these, these stories, I like to put myself in both positions. What if I were the one coming to Jesus, number one, because we're certainly in that position, but then two, what if, what if I'm the one, what if I'm the one that people are coming to me, how would I react? How would I react to the blind man? How would I react to the leper? Would I, with a leper, would I say, I need six foot distancing? No, Jesus put forth his hand and touched the contagious disease. And let, why? Because what was in him was more powerful than what was in that leper. What was in him was more powerful than anything that would try to come. In other words, we have to live our life forward. We have to live our life knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So this morning, let's go over to Matthew chapter 15. Being that today is Mother's Day, this is an awesome, it's an awesome story to see what happened to this mother who had an issue with her child. In verse 21 of Matthew chapter 15, 
Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now, there's a couple of things that's important to note here so that you understand the, the historical context, because as we read this, you're going to see the way that Jesus reacted doesn't seem very loving to begin with. But here's what you have to understand. This woman was a Gentile woman. She was not part of the nation of Israel. And at that time, before Jesus went to the cross, before Jesus was, was raised again, Jesus had one mission. The covenant of God was only available to one group of people at the time, and that was the Israelites. They were the only one, the Jews were the only ones that had the law of God, that had a covenant. God made covenant with Abraham and his descendants. Okay, and so in Genesis chapter 17, when God was promising Isaac to Abraham, he said, as for me, my covenant, my agreement, my protection, you know, and my relationship is with you and it's with your seed. And I will make it with your seed, your children, your offspring in their generation. So the word of God and the life of God and the plan of God came through the children of Israel. So when Jesus came and when he walked on the earth, he wasn't here for non-Jewish people to begin with. His ministry was very clear. It was just to Israel, okay, because that they were still under the law, all right? And we have to understand that as we understand how 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 Jesus reacted. Not only that, so now this, this, this non-Jewish woman that has no covenant with God, no right to receive healing for her daughter, and, and, and mothers get this. Here's what I love. As we see this, this woman had a, I'm not going to give up mentality. This woman was going to do whatever it took to see freedom for her children, or for her daughter in this case. In other words, her love for her daughter, her care for her daughter was that, you know, I'm not going to leave her bound. I'm not going to leave her in this place. I will do whatever it takes. And, and, you know, I think that our culture and our society, you know, has moved away from really honoring the gift of a mother and what that means. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I mean, uh, to me, there's no higher calling than being a mother, because what being a mother, you know, the children that you have, God has given to you because God knows that you have within you the capacity to impart the next generation and to train the next generation and to speak truth in the, in, into their lives. You're not just... You're not just having children for yourself. You're not just having children uh, so that you can, you can build a family. You're actually, what you're doing is you're raising up, according to the Word of God, a godly seed. Get that phrase for a moment. A godly seed. What does seed do? Seed goes out and it multiplies. So we're not just trying to get them to 18 and get out of my house. Apparently, Wendy did that, but no, I'm just kidding. Sometimes it feels that way. Now we're back. Go ahead and bring me another microphone in case this happens again. Thank you, Jesus. This is going to be a great word this morning. We've had so many distractions and things like that, but it doesn't matter. We just go on anyway. We're persistent. Amen. Thank you, Derek. Um, so it's not about getting, I was going to say, I remember uh, there is that time that you recognize it's time for them to go. 
Like I remember the last few months that Olivia leading up to her. <laughs> leading up to her wedding. Jennifer's like, she got she needs to get married now. She needs to go. There's a, mo there's a moment that mother and daughter, man, they are, and them two are so much alike anyway, that it, it's time to kick her out of the nest and it's time to go. You know, our training is over. It is done. But, you know, up to that time, and I think she was really ready too. She was probably saying privately, I can't wait to get out of this house. But, you know, you can, we can talk about those things. We can, we can celebrate those things. But the fact of the matter is, is you have been given mothers the awesome responsibility to impart into the lives of your children to plant the seed of the Word of God so that they can be a seed to their generation, so that they can impact those around us. In other words, and I'll get into more of these things later in weeks to come, because we have an opportunity right now as the body of Christ, as the church of God, to, to not think four walls and to not think, I need to get to church and just, you know, and, and how can God help me and how could God save me and, and, and have a me mentality, but we can actually begin to think bigger and think outside of ourselves and start thinking about how are we impacting our generation right Right now, how are we impacting those? How are we taking what we know to be the Word of God and to let our experience with God and the life of God and the light of God be reflected through our lives so that other people want to be a part, so that they want to experience the freedom that you're experiencing? You get to train your children. You get to impart those things into your children. And, you know, I kind of, it feels like I, I hear somebody saying, yeah, but I don't know the Word. I don't know how to train them. I don't know what to do. Yeah, great. Great. Welcome to everybody else's life as a parent. Nobody's been a parent. It is on the job training. You don't go to you don't go to college and you don't go to trade school to learn how to be a parent. You get to do it from the moment that they're born and get to figure it out. And that's relationship. And you have the Holy Spirit who will lead you and who will guide you. And you need to know you have everything in you that you need to impart the right things into your children. Know who you are, mother. This woman, man, she, she was not going to take no for an answer. And, and, and so sometimes we got to have persistent faith. Say persistent faith. Don't, don't have an attitude, well, if it's God's will, it'll happen. If this woman had that attitude then her daughter would have never been healed. Look at this. So here she is. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Look at this gracious response from Jesus. But he answered her not a word. He did not even get, he didn't answer her at all. Wow, that seems pretty harsh. But, you know, she interrupted his schedule. You know, he actually, when if you read Mark chapter 7, when he went into this place, he didn't want anybody to know that he was there because his mission wasn't to go and minister. His mission wasn't to go and hold a meeting. He was there for some other reason. And so, and so here he is. Jesus is focused on what God had called him to do and focused on his task. And this woman actually didn't have a right to come in and to ask anything. Now, post the cross, Jesus is, his mission is for the whole world. So, so this doesn't apply now. Jesus isn't going about answering not a word or anything like that. Remember, his mission was very much focused, and we're going to see that here in just a moment. So what happened, and so she was crying after him, crying. And, and part of it is the way that she was responding was just, I need help, I need help, help me, and crying. And we're going to see a, 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 a flip here in a moment in her approach. And so he answered her not, not a word, and so she went to the disciples. Please have him come, have him help, I need this help. And so finally the disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away for she cries out after us. She was persistent. She was pestering. She was not going to take no for an answer. 
And so what happened here is that uh, then all of a sudden he says this, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so then what happened is she came and she worshiped him. Sometimes we are crying. Sometimes we are yelling. Sometimes we are responding to God emotionally. God, help me. I need. And there's no faith in that. There's no honor in that. There's, um, as a matter of fact, you think about something that happened in the life of David. He and his men, they had gone out to battle. This is before he became king. And so while they were gone, there was an army that came into their city and, and, and burned the city and took the women and children and kidnapped them and took them away. And so when David and his men came back from battle and they found the city burned, they found their families gone. David's the leader, and what happens is, is, is they all begin to cry. They all begin to wail and to weep, and, to, uh, you know, th their families had been taken, had been gone. And so, and then for David, it went from bad to worse. Because while they're all crying, so there's no solution in crying. There's no answer in crying. Now, sometimes... You, you know, I like crying's not wrong. You know, we weep with those that weep, but that's not where the answer comes from. And you have to recognize that because there are some people that will get stuck in grieving over something that was lost. This is a word from, this is a word from God for somebody right now. Thank you, Father. Listen to this. If you've lost a family member... You've lost a child. You've lost somebody in the past that was very dear to you. And you've never been able to move beyond that pain. And you've never been able to move beyond that loss. And so you're still grieved over that. And it's been years now. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, it's time to move beyond the grief and the weeping and the crying and to move forward into the new things because what's happened is it, your, your life has stopped because of this one event that has happened. And even the thoughts of, yeah, but if I had done this or if we had known this, it has kept you in the past. And child of God, listen to me very carefully. And I don't know if this is by live stream or if it's somebody that's here. But Paul said, look, if Paul had the opportunity and if Paul, he could, have, he could have been stuck more than anybody else. Because Paul was the guy that went about killing Christians. Paul was the one that put them in jail. Paul was the one that was responsible for, for the deaths of many people. And then he became one, and he could have been stuck in the horror of, man, if I just, if I had known better, if I hadn't have done this, so many people would have died. But he said in Philippians, he said, this one thing that I've learned to do, I forget those things. I put behind me, I forget those things that are behind. And I press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm not going to be defined by my past. I'm not going to be defined by my mistakes. I'm not going to be defined by the pain and by the loss. I'm not going to get stuck in that place. And there's freedom for you today. Man, I just feel the Spirit of God all over this. There's freedom for you today. Today is a day for you to let it go and to move forward. And there's going to be healing to your heart this morning as we pray at the end of this service. Thank you, Jesus. And so David had a situation where they were crying. They had lost their whole families, their wives and their children. And then all of a sudden his men that were under him turned on him and said, we're just going to kill you, David. This is your fault. So now not only had David lost his family, but now people are wanting to kill him. And so he could have sat there and he could have cried and he could have moaned and complained and he could have, you know, just like, well, poor is me and woe is me. And 
what am I going to do? And God, you know, you're the one that told me to do this. And God, this is your fault. He could have done that. But that's not how he responded. David, the Bible says, encouraged himself in the Lord. He took a moment. He got rid. It says that they finally cried when they couldn't cry anymore. There was no power in the weeping. There's no power in the crying. There's no power in the poor me and woe is me and God, please help me in that sense. There's no power in that when, 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 you're, when you're just, uh, uh, just self-focused and you're wallowing in your own self-pity and your pain and you're crying in your situation. There's a moment that you have to rise above it and begin to have faith in the solution, faith in the one that has the answer. Begin to look to Jesus. Don't just ask Jesus to help, but believe that he can. Amen. When the man came to Jesus and said, my son is also demon-possessed, and your disciples, I came to them, they could not cast him out. And, and, and Jesus said, if you can believe, whoo, all things... Somebody say all things. All things are possible to him who believes. What is Jesus trying to do? And he's doing this here with this woman. What is he doing? He's trying to move them from a place of, of focusing on the problem, focusing on the need, focusing on their inability, and try to move them and get them, uh, instead of self-focused, and woe is me and poor is me, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and try to move to, the, to him and to believe in him, who is the situation, who, I mean, who is the solution, who is the one that can be the answer to that problem. Move them into a place of faith and believing because that's where, the, that's where the power of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, the healing power, that's where it's released into a person's life. Even as it talks about, I want you to understand that it, you're the one that gets to decide what you're going to believe. You make that choice. That's what Jennifer and I have learned over the last eight and a half years. We get to choose what we believe what we believe truly in our heart. I'm not going to talk about all that right now. I talk about that a lot. But that's what's changed our lives is, is what we believe and who we believe. It's moved us into the experience of a relationship with Christ that has so radically changed our lives. We experience him every single day and we know him. We know whom we have believed. And, and so Jesus is always wanting to bring people to a place of faith because it's in that place that grace can be experienced and the goodness of God can be experienced. And even with that man, that man said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And, because, and, and just because of that connection and that belief, the man's son was healed. And so David had to encourage himself in the Lord because there's no power in weeping. There's no power in crying, but there's power in worship and there's power as you begin to focus on the answer. Many of you probably, you need to take your eyes off of your situation and off of your circumstances. And then, and it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, we don't look at, we don't consider while we look not at the things which are seen in this natural world. That our natural, your situation is temporary. What's going on in your life and in your family, what's going on with your children, all of that is temporary right now. <clears throat> Just temporary. But it says we look at the things which are not seen. In other words, we envision in our lives, in our, in our hearts, we imagine, we look at what is not seen. <coughs> the Word of God, what God has promised, who Jesus is, the unchanging nature of God, because that's eternal. And all of this here, if you'll believe, well, has to line up with what is eternal. Praise God. And so as David encouraged himself in the Lord, moved away from the emotion of weeping, moved away from the emotion of grief, moved away from the emotion of loss, what he began is to focus on the Lord. I'm going to praise you, but I'm going to bless the Lord, all my, you know, oh, my soul and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm not going to forget his benefits. He heals all my diseases. He forgives 
all my iniquities. He forgives my mistakes. He redeems my life from destruction. The angel encamps around about me. A thousand can fall at my side. And so here's David. He is singing. He's encouraging himself in the Lord. I don't know what he was singing, but being that he wrote so many psalms, it had to be something to, to bring him from the place of, of depression and, 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 and grief to a place of, God, should I go and pursue this army? Should we go now and get our children and our families back? And God said, go. God couldn't have told him to go in the middle of grief. Did you hear that? God couldn't tell him to go in the middle of, of the crying because he wasn't in a place emotionally that he could respond to that. That's why you have to encourage yourself. That's why you have to take your emotions. That's why you, and just kind of pull yourself up, so, you, so to speak, by your bootstraps. I don't even know what that phrase means. I'm sure it has means something. You, some of you probably know. But pull yourself up and encourage yourself in the Lord. And you say, well, I'm not going to live in this grief. I'm not going to live in this pain. I'm not going to live in, in, this, in this depression. I'm not going to live in this woe me attitude. Jesus, I'm looking to you. You're the author and the finisher of my faith. Jesus, I'm looking to you. You're the one that has already made me more than a conqueror. I triumph through you. You have a great life plan for me. In other words, you're taking your eyes off of yourself. You're focused focusing on him who is the giver of all life, and he is the answer to your situation. Let's look and what, see what happened. And so, of course, David, they went, they defeated, and they got their children, their families back, their wives back, everything. But it was because he encouraged himself in the Lord. And look at verse 25 here back in Matthew chapter 15. So this woman who had no right to get help at this moment, had no covenant with God, came and worshipped him. So now she changed. She stopped crying. She stopped begging. She stopped pleading. And now she came and she worshipped him who had the answer to her situation. And so she said, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. He didn't make it easy on her, did he? But again, he's talking about what the situation was in that day. All right? And here's the awesome thing about it. He wasn't calling her a dog. You know, a, 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 this particular Greek word is talking about a, a, a precious pet, a little dog, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, so, and so there's some, you know, you, it's like texting, right? When you text somebody, you think, why did they say that? And you get mad at them. It's like somebody's mad at you. And you call them like, no, that's not what I meant by it at all. Texting, the word sometimes doesn't, um, uh, doesn't invoke or, 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 or show you the emotion and the intent behind it. And so we misinterpret that. So sometimes when we read through Scripture, we got to make sure that we are interpreting in the light of the character and nature of Jesus, which is one of love, not one of harshness. And so we think that these words would indicate, oh, wow, he's being mean, he's being hard. No, wait a minute, we know who Jesus is. And he is love personified. So everything that he had to have said had to have been done with an attitude and with, a, uh, with the emotion of love and compassion behind it. Okay? And so I could almost see him doing this with a smile and just, just kind of joking with her a little bit. You know, you know, it's not good to take the children's bread. Now, this tells us one thing that's very important. Healing is called the children's bread. Healing is called the children's bread. What does bread mean? Bread is it's, it's essential. It sustains our life. Healing isn't something that is just optional. Healing is part of our covenant with God. And healing didn't pass away with the last apostle. This is the reason that Jesus came, to redeem us from sin and all of its fruit, which includes sickness and disease. And that's why Matthew 8, 17 says he took our sicknesses. He took our diseases. And then 1 Peter 2, 24, that by his stripes, we were healed. And so here he's saying that healing is the children's bread. Here's the good news for you. If you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you've accepted him in, if you are born again, you are a child of God. You are a child of Abraham. The Bible says those that are Christ are 
Abraham's seed. And so now the covenant of God is available in part, or it's not available, it is now made with you as well. You have the same covenant rights that Jesus himself did. We are joint heirs with him. Praise God. That's, the Bible is nothing but good news. But so many people won't hear and won't receive and won't live out that good news because it seems too good to be true. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet. Look, don't you just love this? This I am going to, I, it doesn't make any difference. I am getting what I came here for. Yes, Lord, yet even those precious little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. What I want to submit to you is at this moment, something took place. Check this out. When she said that, there was a connection. Mm. Alan, you can come on up. Thank you, Father. Again, because of the relationship, because I think of the, of, of the loving, compassion way that Jesus was bringing her into a place of faith, that in that moment, what happened is she recognized healing is there, the bread is there. I'm, as he's even referring to me as a, maybe I'm not part of the family. Thank you, Father. <sighs> Jesus wasn't responding to her harshly. He was creating a picture of family. He was creating a picture of what goes on in a family and how the, how the covenant and the Word of God was meant, you know, for the children of God. But that even what he was saying is that you're there, you're close. You're right there where, where the bread is being handed out. And she saw the picture and recognized yeah, I'm in a position where I can even get some crumbs and the things. And she moved, and, and what happened in her heart is when, when that picture of family, when that picture, when, when Jesus kind of gave her that picture, she was able now to reach out by faith and believe and say, ah, yes, it is available. I can, I can reach it. And I'm going to prove this to you. Look at this. Because... Jesus didn't do anything. Watch this. You're going to see this. Jesus didn't do anything to cast the devil out of, out of her daughter. He didn't lay hands on her. He didn't, he didn't speak, you know, and, you know, you must leave in, you know, in my name or anything. He didn't do any of that. Watch. Watch what happens. So when Jesus said that, he, he, he opened up a way for her to be able to, to reach out and to take something by faith and to believe. And, and so her heart connected with it in faith. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs, those little precious pets, they eat those crumbs which fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered and said, oh, woman, great is your faith. She got to receive and step into a covenant that didn't even rightfully belong to her. Her persistence and her recognition of, of who Jesus was. He says, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I want to read it in Mark chapter 7. Verse 27. So this is Mark telling the same story. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first for it's not good to take the children's bread and then throw it to those little dogs and she answered and said yes Lord yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs and look at verse 29 he said for this saying you got it you connected to it 
go your way. Look at this. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Why did the demon go out? Jesus didn't do anything. She took it. She said something. She wouldn't take no for an answer. And Jesus just simply responded, wow, woman, you have great faith. And because you've connected in faith to the bread, it's already been done. That demon's already gone out. It was because of her faith. I want to encourage you mothers. You know, you have the opportunity to believe and to pray. So many people have been saved. So many children's lives have been rescued because of the prayers of mothers and grandmothers. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, let's look at this real quick. Then I'm going to pray with you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Thank you, Father. Man, I just love the compassion and the love that Jesus has to help, help encourage and help bring people out of a place of grief and out of a place of, of, of worry and out of a place of anxiety and out of a place of distress and to bring him into a place of faith and trust in him. Paul, as he was talking to young Timothy here, a young man that he was raising in ministry, he says, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Look at this. Three generations. There's a reflection. Three generations. His grandmother had lived a life of genuine faith. His mother, because of his grandmother, had also lived a life of genuine faith. And now Timothy, as a third generation, that they were teaching and imparting and raising up and Timothy became a great minister of the gospel, a great pastor of churches. But it was, but what if, what if his grandmother had not taken the responsibility? What if his mother had said, you know what, what your, gra you know, your, your grandmother's a little crazy. We're going to go do something a little different. No, they took it seriously. And because of that, Timothy was set up and prepared to go into ministry and to impact the lives of thousands and to be involved. And we, as we still read about him today. So what, what Paul's encouragement to him was in verse 6, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. This is probably the Holy Spirit that was on the inside of him. And to stir that up. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Thank you, Father.